Dr. Laura Tuchen is a Singaporean writer honored as one of Asia's most inspiring women. She published her first best-selling biography, Woman on Top, in 2014. And now she's working on three more books on leadership. I caught up with Dr. Laura Tuchen during her recent visit to Bhutan. Your book, Women on Top, uh is said to be one of the best-selling books and a daring biography. What inspired you to write this book? Um, quite honestly, what inspired me was just knowing that there were many alienated young people, not just young people, but people, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Asia. I think in our culture, and when I say our, I just mean an Asian culture in general. I know I'm stereotyping and I could be making some generalizations, right? But in order to have a discussion, I need, I need to make some blanket generalizations. But I think in our Asian culture, we, we are often taught to, to be quiet, to be stoic, to keep everything within. Um, and while I think that is something very admirable about Asian cultures, that makes it so stoic, you know, like how the Japanese, you know, handle the, the, the tsunamis and the earthquakes. But by the very same token, there's also a, a sense of repression because a lot of the anger hurt, sadness, it has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it either goes in and it eats you up or it goes out and you become angry, you take it out of other people. And, and I saw that happening uh, just within my, my, my peers. Um, just around 2014 when I was writing the book, I think I had three friends commit suicide. Um, in 2015, I had another friend who read the book and, and told me how much it inspired her. Um, she also suicided. Um, and, and I really wanted to write the book to inspire young men and young women. Um, and I wrote it in very simple English. Um, and I've had feedback that it's quite readable within three hours. Oh, wow. And what I really wanted was to inspire these young men and women, or just men and women in general, regardless of any age, to pick up the book on a day that you're, they're really down or bored. And, and just read it and realize that there really is more to life and that life is really worth living for and that the life that we lead is a privilege. I think most times we think that, you know, we're sold messages all the time that our life should be better, more glamorous, richer, more flamboyant, have more this and have more that. And you have more Gucci's and Chanel's and this and that. You'd be bigger, richer, better, and your life would be better. And we're constantly sold these messages, which I think somehow makes people feel, oh, then, then I'm not capable or I'm not good enough mm -hmm. or if I don't have all this, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, successful. And I wanted to send out a very different story because when I was 24 and I shared with you and I wrote it very specifically in my book, when I was 24, I had two friends um, suicide. Uh, one of it was my best friend and, and she suicided and I witnessed all of it. And I realized then that, that life is so transient. Um, it's so short. Oh. I get teary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so precious because one day she's there and the next day she's gone. And I think at 24, I, I didn't have the vocabulary to learn how to deal with anything so big. I mean, I've had grandparents die and uncles and aunties and, you know, my dog died. But it's different when you see someone so youthful and so vibrant just end their life. And it, it made me feel that I wanted to, when I am better and when I am in a right age and place and time in my life to, to write the story, to share it so that people know that it's not the only way out. Because mm -hmm. when I witnessed her suicide, I fell into a depression and, and I pondered on, on life, you know, like Buddha and Je Jesus, not saying I am like that, but, but like them, you know, sometimes you needed a crisis or something that shakes you out of your comfort zone that makes you want to go out to explore what's mm -hmm. more in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what happened to me at 24. Because nobody at my age was thinking about life and death at 24. Mm -hmm. They were just thinking about the education, getting married, getting mm -hmm. a career, mm -hmm. you know. And I was thinking about very serious things like life and death. And um, it made me decide that I was going to dedicate my life to, to helping others get better, to volunteering, and, and to spread the message of inspiration and, and hope and, and light. And that life really does matter. Mm -hmm. And in your book, uh, you talk about your colorful life uh, <laughs> growing up yeah. with your celebrity movie star brother. Yeah. And, uh, and you have also mentioned the tragedies in your life. Yeah. So how difficult was it to encapsulate all those events uh, into a book? Yeah, really good question. I think at the start it was quite tough. I mean, I'm very vocal and I can talk and I can share publicly. Uh, but when you are actually writing, it's a very different process. I mean, I, I write academically, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a professor by training, but to have yourself write it all down is quite tough. So what I did was actually I had uh, someone to record me like you. Uh, she interviewed me like you, and then she recorded it and she transcribed it. 
and then I, I worked on it because that way I feel removed from it. Mm -hmm. Because when I sat down to type my story, I was like, uh, where do I start? Talking about it for me was easier because mm -hmm. I was like having a conversation mm -hmm. with you. It's easier to relate. So I, she interviewed me, she transcribed it, and then I, I, I went about to, to write it. Uh, so I didn't just write about the tragedies, and I saw them less as tragedies than, than they are crisis. And it was the life lessons that I took from it that's important. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, none of us around here will have the same stories. We won't have the same journey. The details of the journey are not important, but what mm -hmm. we learned from it yes. to me was important. And that was what I really wanted to encapsulate in the book, to make like bite-sized life lessons from the journey that I went through. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also write about little victories. Um, I think I, some of the little tragedies that I talked about were you know, witnessing the suicide, um, talking about what I saw when I was in Cambodia working with sex traffic workers. Um, I also talked about my first public business failure and mm -hmm. how that impacted me. And, and that became uh, inspiration for my other books on leadership and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think I also wrote about my, both my parents. My dad had colorectal cancer and my mother had a brain tumor and how I, I, I coursed through that. Mm -hmm. And I also shared that, you know, caregivers are very important. We mm -hmm. often think about the, the patient. We never think about the caregiver. So I, I tried to encapsulate all these little nuggets mm -hmm. of my life mm -hmm. and try to give inspiring life lessons from that. And uh, what do you want your readers to take from this book? Uh, I want them to take away that life is amazing. That don't be fooled into thinking that the life that you live is, is, is a given. It's not. From all my travels around the world, even here in Bhutan, you know, I was sharing with you earlier, we would like to think that we're all born equal, but we're not. Mm -hmm. um, you and I probably had the privilege of having had an education a lot of people don't have that privilege. We're sold the idea that it's a, a fundamental right. Yes, we would like it to be a fundamental right, but mm -hmm. someone born in Syria now or someone born in Ethiopia would probably not have the same opportunities we have. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it is just that much harder. And it's not equal. But what we can do is to try to treat people fairly, as equally as we can, and as an individual to recognize that we have a right to live our life as positively as we can possibly can, because there's some other people who would never have the opportunity to live the life that you and I lead. Even though we think we're having a horrible life today. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying that when I was 24 and I volunteered in a sex traffic camp with, with, with sex traffic workers, and they're the ages between eight to 15. And they broke my heart because, you know, here I was, I, 24-year-old thinking, oh, I've just went through the biggest tragedy of my life. And I spoke to these 10-year-old girls who, who are forced, you know, prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, oh, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a nurse. And I'll say, oh, why do you want to do that? And they say, oh, because I want to save the world. And it made me feel, wow, here are 10-year-olds who are beaten and sexual slaves and they're thinking about healing other people and saving the world. And it made me realize that for every one girl that Angelina Jolie or Madonna can rescue, mm -hmm. there are thousands and millions that, that mm -hmm. you and I could never reach out to. Right. Um, we can do our best to help them, but I honestly think that the best meditation I take from it is that you and I and in our lives and even some of the viewers watching, that some of our lives are far more privileged than a lot of these other men and women, young boys and girls. And, and we have a responsibility to live our life as best as we can for those that, who could possibly never do that in their lifetime. Dr. Loretta Chen is also listed among the top 50 powerful women in Asia. She has worked in films, television, radio, print, and more. You are Singapore's most prominent uh, entertainment personality. Right. And uh, you run a media empire, and yeah. then extending from uh, film, theater, uh, television, radio, and press. So how did uh, you become a super achiever? I don't know if you call it empire. Wow, I mean, I maybe really feel like Oprah Winfrey, but I, I don't, it's, it's funny. I think it's, you know, I've, I've been interviewing a lot of women leaders, or just leaders in general, and I realized that we, we don't realize when we're doing it that we're doing so many things. I think we're just spurred by so much energy. I think you can tell I'm very energetic. And it's just one thing leads to another. I think my mind works so fast. I mean, this is the year of the monkey, right? So maybe mm -hmm. my, year, my, my mind will work even faster. 
I think because there's so much energy, there's so many things we want to do, there's so many things we want to accomplish. I think for me, there's so many people I want to help, so many communities I, I want to support, um, so many causes I, I want to um, support and fight for, that I think a lot of my projects, all the one thing in common of all my projects is that they're all about other people, they're all about people. Hmm. Um, they're all about giving w with a heart. Um, some of my projects, most of them are more like social enterprises, hmm. Uh, so that we can raise funds to support needy communities, needy charities, um, social causes that I, I really feel for children, women, um, marginalized communities. That has been a lot of my work. Obviously, I balance it out with, with projects that do pay the bills, like working with corporate big wigs, um, like you know, some, some brands like Samsung, etc. Mm -hmm. Can I say that on air? But mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, working with corporate big wigs, you know, because that generates the funds that I can also then take to my um, like my books, my you know my, my other projects as well, yeah. And you have already completed three of your books, I believe. Uh, books? Yes, I'm in the midst of right. Uh, I've completed one more. Uh, that's based on a, a social entrepreneur in, in Singapore. Um, again, I wanted to in inspire people because she was a school dropout and mm -hmm. she became one of the biggest retailers in Singapore. And now she's a social entrepreneur and a dear friend of mine. And I wanted to profile her story to inspire school dropouts, you know, because I think in Singapore, there's so much emphasis on academic excellence. You've mm -hmm. got to be so competitive. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that's not important, but I'm saying that there are other, there are other alternatives. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a good example. Uh, and then my other book is on 30 women leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I did women leaders because I wanted to inspire mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. I feel that they, they hold up half the sky and half the world. So I distill all their life lessons, kind of like what I, I did for myself. I'm now doing it with other people distill their life lessons into a, a, a book. Um, and the final one is on change makers. So these may be younger individuals or they could be working even in little communities like Bhutan or Cambodia or Japan. But they are individuals who are not just driven by monetary gain, mm -hmm. but they wish to genuinely do something for the world. You know, so, so for example, I may buy one, you, you may make a Kira and I'll give uh, a, another Kira free, you know, or, mm -hmm. or you, somebody, you know, says you, you make a pair of sunglasses or buy a pair of sunglasses and I'll give a pair of sunglasses to someone in an embattled community. So a lot of change makers, I feel with social media these days, a lot of young people are empowered. They feel mm -hmm. they want to do something for the community. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to showcase their work because mm -hmm. they're so humble. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't want to talk about it and they may not have the financial clout or the marketing genius to, to know how to go about talking about their work. So I wanted to, to support them and, and write about them. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about your uh, most controversial and uh, most uh, powerful play, The V Monologue, uh, uh, do you call yourself uh, an artist or a feminist? I, I, I was first going to you know, take a pause and say I've done so many controversial things. So, uh, and in, but, let, but, but let me address that controversial thing. I, I, I don't believe in doing controversy for controversy's mm -hmm. sake. I always believe in provoking people to think. Um, and usually people consider that controversial because it is not the norm. Mm -hmm. It's not um, what is usually acceptable. But I always want to challenge what people think is acceptable and what is the norm. Um, because once you start raising those questions, then people start questioning their own assumptions and questioning their own learned behavior, which may or may not be right or wrong. But I like questioning people like, why? Why do you do something you know, un unconsciously? So, so that's why I, I choose controversial issues, because it, it provokes people to think. I think thinking is so important in today's day and age, where we're fed all these media images and you just accept it blindly, Instagramming or Twitter, and you think, oh, that's the absolute truth. But... I, I always believe in critical thinking. I mean, that, that's what my PhD is in. But to answer your question, so the V monologues. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of the most controversial, I think, because it, it, it questions and it is about, well, the other 50% of our population, right? And I think it raises really important questions about femininity and about womanhood that people don't ask. I mean, I don't even know I can say this on air, but, you know, so many things about women are taboo. You know, childbearing mm -hmm. is taboo mm -hmm. or menstruation mm -hmm. is taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, rape, mm -hmm. people don't want to come out and talk about mm -hmm. it because it's such a huge shame and sense of shame when women suffer mm -hmm. um, abuse. Again, women don't come out and talk about it. But if nobody talks about it, then how are these women ever going to come out and get stronger and become better um, and heal because if they continually suffer in silence then it's one of I feel the, the biggest injustices that we can do as educated men and women alike 
if we're educated and, and we stand by and do nothing, I mean, I can't go knock on people's doors and say, hey, you know, drag your woman out and we want to heal her. I mean, I, I am in no position to do that. I, I don't think that that is um, how I go about doing my work. I think I like to do it more subtly, more gently. I, I provoke thinking and debate through my art. Mm -hmm. But I want you to, to reflect on your own behavior because unlike a politician, I'm not going to go bang down your doors. I mean, even politicians can't do that. I, I can't go bang down your doors and say, look, I want you to, I demand you to make these changes. I don't think that is right per se as well. Maybe not for me. I, I don't think it is. I think change has to be from here. Mm -hmm. It's got to be accepted in your, in your mind and in your heart. And then you, you, you adopt the practices and, and do that. And I just felt that not just in communities like Bhutan, but even in urban communities, you'll be surprised. There's so many things that go behind closed doors that people don't want to address. You know, um, the term walking to doors is a euphemism for women who get beat up by their husbands and, and they can't talk about it. So to say, oh, I, I walked into a door. Mm. And if we don't allow a conversation these, not just women, but men and women and children, you know, they will always think that they live in a cult of shame and, and, and or, or, or peer pressure or, and always having to do things that people think is, is the right thing to do, but without ever really questioning and coming out to say, hey, um, I don't know if what's happening at home is right. I don't know if what's happening to my mom is right. I don't know if my sister going on that blind date and having had being coerced into sex was right. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody was there to ever question mm -hmm. that. And then we are unconsciously allowing things to happen. I think a lot of what I do is to provoke consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's not to just have controversy, but to provoke consciousness, I think. And uh, you are honored as uh, one of the most inspiring and powerful <laughs> women in Asia. Uh, yeah. So what is, uh, as per you, what is the beautiful aspect of being a woman? Oh, well, that's how much time have you got, right? I was joking, but um, I think there's so many beautiful aspects to, to being a woman. But I think one of the key things that I want women to harness is the sense of, like you say, beauty, mm -hmm. inner and out, and harness the self-confidence, our ability to, to create and give birth. It's not by chance. Mm -hmm. And I think women... Whether or not you give birth or not, that's not the point. But the fact that the, there is a reason why God made women creators and procreators and be able to birth new life, I think we must harness that ability as a community. I mean, I know there are some women out there who have either chosen to not have children or are unable to have children. I'm not talking about the, the act of physical childbearing, even though, yes, that is the ultimate act of giving life. Mm -hmm. But I mean just the fact that as a shared community as women, the fact that we can create, we give birth to, to things, we, we have to harness that and, and we need to cherish that and, and share that with, with our family and um, to nurture our young, both boys and girls alike, not just girls. But I feel almost, especially girls, because they tend, I, I say tend, I know society is changing now, to be the nurturers and the caregivers, mm -hmm. um, the mothers. And if they don't have that sense of self-esteem and self-confidence, how are they going to impart their knowledge mm -hmm. to their own children? I, I, again, I know that both men and women have a responsibility alike in, in, in raising a, a great family. But I, I really want women to recognize that we have the ability to create and if we do, we should really harness that and, and work together as a community because I also find that sometimes women, we are our own worst critics. We'll mm -hmm. say, oh, we're fat, oh, we're mm -hmm. stupid, oh, we're, we're, we're not good enough. You know, I've, I've come up to women and say, oh, you're so smart and you're good looking and I give them uh, compliments and they say, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's humility, which is a great trait. Being humble is, is a great trait to, to harness and, and have. And I owe that to my father. I, I look up to him a lot. My sense of humility, I, I, I take from my father. But I think it's also a very fine line where we are guilty of being passive. Mm -hmm. um, where we think that, oh, I, I can't do it, I can't do it, oh, I don't know how to do it. And, and that becomes, while I love the simplicity and the humility, women have to be very careful to not let that become ignorance mm -hmm. and a lack of self-esteem and a lack of self-confidence. Because all of that will deteriorate the sense of self and, 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 and that gets passed on mm -hmm. to your offspring and, and the people around you too. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that women should, should harness our, our beauty of, of creating. Mm -hmm. 
So besides being a theatre director, TV personality, uh, I mean celebrity, and then a writer, and creative then director. you are a creative director yeah. and writer as well. Yeah. So uh, and then I believe you train That's on right. leadership as well. So That's how right. how important is it for women to uh, uh, to take charge and uh, explore new horizons uh, to contribute to uh, their community and the world in general? That's an excellent question. I've never sold myself as a leadership consultant or coach, but perhaps it's age. Mm -hmm. Right now that I'm older, actually corporations and 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 even I've I've worked with CEOs. Um, big corporate CEOs, I've worked with leaders. Um, I'm actually here to do a um, leadership workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I was hired by uh, DHI to, to conduct leadership workshops. I've never sold my services as a leadership consultant or a coach, but mm -hmm. I think what it is is that the ability to dare to speak up, to not just talk about your successes, but to, to also talk about your, your failures and what you've learned from them, the life lessons. And uh, like you're talking about leadership, I, I think it is so important for us to leave a legacy. Because it's no longer just about developing one particular leader. Because like I said, you know, I, I think all our lives are, are very transient and, and very mortal. I think what I like to leave behind is a legacy of, of, of leadership, authentic leadership, which is driven by the self. Mm -hmm. We can read a lot of books, we can read a lot of different leadership models um, from across the world, but it may not all be applicable so a leadership model developed in America may not be immediately applicable in Bhutan. A leadership model developed in Japan or in Singapore may not be immediately applicable in Bhutan or Cambodia or Thailand because we've got different backgrounds. So what I think is key about leadership or, or, or what I created called centered and authentic leadership is that we take from all the canon of leadership models and studies and theories and surveys and create our own that comes from within that comes from a deep understanding of our surroundings, our culture, our people, who we are. Because I can come in with an American jargon and impose it on mm -hmm. the Bhutanese community. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that is fair because there are a lot of considerations that uh, an outsider may not have thought of or the chillet may not have thought of. So I think it's really important to see it from the locals' eyes, to see their constraints, to see their challenges, to learn to appreciate their culture, their beliefs, the, 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 their, their spirit, and then try and see how we can suture developed models, uh, existing models, and see how we can apply some of those best practices mm -hmm. in a localized community. I would, for one, be the first to propose that. I'm a big proponent of that, to say that I think leadership has to come from within. We have to develop it from within the community. We take and borrow what is best Mm -hmm. um, for our own practices, but we develop our own centered and authentic leadership. To me, I think that is the, the, the best course of action. Uh, you were mentioning earlier that uh, Bhutan has changed you. It has changed me. Oh my goodness. So tell us more about uh, it. Okay, again, how much time have you got? I can talk for hours. <laughs> it's changed me. You and all your wonderful people, you have all changed me so profoundly. Again, I can't do this without like getting teary. I wrote about it briefly in my book. I think eventually, maybe I'm 60, I'll, I'll write a book developed, uh, especially for Bhutan. In 2012, when I came here, I had gone through you know, a series of fairly tough uh, times, right? My, my dad's uh, cancer, my mom's uh, brain tumor, uh, my public business ventures. I mean, I have a lot of successful ones, but I chose to highlight the, the one that wasn't successful because that's the best launch pad. Um, and then I came here in 2012. For some bizarre reason, I think uh, God wanted me to come here. And I was actually hired by DHI to conduct training here. I pride myself as being somebody that reads a lot, travels a lot. I'm very grateful for that. But when I came to Bhutan, I was struck by the beauty of the people. Because you're so gracious. You're so compassionate. I think there's a fallacy in the Western world and developed nations that Bhutan is incredibly rich, like you're just oozing lots of money and, you know, oozing gold. And I remember the other day my friend was just texting me and saying, oh, can you, you know, meet a rich Bhutanese prince for me? And I said, well, <laughs> it's kind of hard to squeeze milk from stones. They have a lot of stones, but what I can milk for you is their rich sense of compassion and, and, and humility and grace which I find is, is quite um, increasingly rare to find in urbanized societies where people live in silos, we work in silos, <clears throat> we're increasingly very motivated only by monetary gain, financial gain. Again, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's increasingly very material. 
Whereas I think in Bhutan, there was still a deep sense of um, family, of community. Um, you can tell that everyone walking on the street, well, most people walking on the street are very aware of their surroundings because you take time to appreciate you know, the sun, the trees, the, the earth. A lot of people in, in our very urbanized societies forget that. There's a great, um, again, your, your, your kingdom is the first and your fourth king is the first to, to have coined the term, you know, GNH mm -hmm. and gross national happiness, and I'll, I'm the first to embrace that. I think what is all this material gain if we have no sense of graciousness and compassion and we're unable to see ourselves through other people's eyes. And I think you Bhutanese are, are, are walking examples of that. But above all, it changed my life personally because as a, you know, Korea woman, I always thought, oh, I have no time for a family. My family is, you know, my my students, my staff, my communities. I will want to mentor them and be like a, you know, little hip Mother Teresa. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, in no ways do I compare myself to her, but like, I thought that that was what I wanted to do. And then when I came here, I saw so many happy couples. You may not have a lot financially in terms of ma the material aspect compared to uh, developed nations, but you, you seem happy. You have little children running around. Um, your little children seem happy, mm -hmm. even with a little corn in their hand. Um, I saw that, you know, men did manly things like chop the trees and the women would, you know, make the fire <laughs> and then the, the kids would be playing around the fire and there's something about that image that just hit home and I said, wow, I, I want to know what that feels like mm -hmm. to have a sense of family, you know, and, and I said about manifesting um, a husband and, 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 and a family and I'm very pleased to say that now I got married oh. <laughs> in 2015. Congratulations. And I will say uh, Bhutan did that to mm -hmm. me because you made me feel that, wow, aside from the achievements mm -hmm. that you say, you know, at the end of the day when I'm in my dying breath, I'm not, nobody recounts, oh, I, I wrote X number of books, I made X number of dollars, mm -hmm. I set up so many communities, I've reached so many people, I've touched, nobody says that. Everyone just says, and I just want to be surrounded by, by my family, the people that I love and who love me and who are the closest mm -hmm. and dearest to me. You, know, may, you, may, you may touch millions of people in your lifetime, but millions may not be around you on, 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 in your dying breath, and, and you just want the, your, your, your family around you. So I decided that that's what I wanted. I wanted to, to start a family. So, so that's what Bhutan did to me. Dr. Loretta Chen, thank yes. you very much for your time oh, thank and you sharing so much. your insight. Thank you. And I hope you continue to inspire women and girls out there. And men and young boys yes, as well. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The only time I feel good falling is when I'm falling.